Harrogate eased his way among the rotting trucks and carts at the curbside until he had the lay of things, and then his scrawny hand darted out and seized a peach from a basket and tucked it down the windsock of a pocket that hung inside his trousers. The next thing he knew, an old lady had him by the collar and was beating him over the head with a meal scoop. She was yelling in his face and spraying him with snuff juice. Shit, said Harrogate, trying to pull away. A long ripping sound ensued. Quit it! You're tearing my goddamn shirt! Bong, 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 went the meal scoop on his bony head. Give it back, she squalled. Hellfire, here! He thrust the peach at her, and she immediately turned loose of him and took the peach and wobbled back to her truck and restored it to the basket. He felt his head. It was all naughty. Shut a brick, he said. I didn't want the goddamn thing that bad. A legless beggar mounted on a board like a piece of ghastly taxidermy had come awake to laugh at him. Fuck you, said Harrogate. The beggar shot forward on ball-bearing wheels and seized Harrogate's leg and bit it. Shit, screamed Harrogate. He tried to pull away, but the beggar had his teeth locked in the flesh of his calf. They danced and circled, Harrogate holding to the top of the beggar's head. The beggar gave a shake of his head and a tug and a last effort to remove the flesh from Harrogate's leg bone and then turned loose and receded smoothly to his place against the wall and took up his pencils again. Harrogate went limping down the street holding his leg. Crazy sons of bitches, he said, hobbling among the shoppers. He was almost in tears. He crossed through the market house and went up the other side of the square. Something was pulling at his shoe. He bent to see. Chewing gum. He sat in the gutter with a stick and scraped at it, turning a pink blob of it on the end of the stick. Harrogate coasted by the blind man in front of Bowers, watching the crowd. No one watched back. He returned, bent lightly, jabbed with his stick at the cigar box in the blind man's lap. The blind man raised his head and put one hand over the box and looked about. Harrogate going up the street tilted the stick. A dime clung to the end of it. He swung about and came back. The blind man sat warily. Pale blue and mold-grown grapes caved and wrinkled in his eye sockets. Harrogate executed a fencer's thrust and came up with a nickel. Hey, you cocksucker, called the blind man. Fuck you, said Harrogate, skipping nimbly on. Coming down the steep and angled path behind the tall frame houses, he thought he heard a voice. He tilted back his head to see. Half out from a house window, High up the laddered face of soot-cocked clapboards hung some creature, sprawled against the hot and sun-peeled siding with arms outstretched like a broken puppet. Ha! he called down. Spawn of Cerberus, the devil's close kin! Harrogate clutched his lower teeth. A long finger pointed down. Child of darkness, of Cludy's brood, mind me. Shit, said Harrogate. The window figure had raised itself to address some other audience. See him! Does he not offend thee? Does not such iniquity not rise, stinking to the very heavens? The viperous evangelist reared up, his elbows cocked and goat's eyes smoking, and thrust a bony finger down. Die, he screamed. Perish a terrible death with thy bowels blown open and black blood boiling from thy nether eye, God save your soul, amen. Shit, fire, said Harrogate, scurrying down the path with one hand over his head. When he reached the street, he looked back. The figure had wheeled to a new window, the better to see the boy past his house, and he leaned now with his face pressed to the glass, his head jaundiced flesh splayed against the pane, and one eye walled up in his head, a goggling visage misshapen with hatred. 
Harrogate went on. Great God Almighty, he said. What do you think of the Country Mouse's first outing to Knoxville, the big city? It's your favorite part. Why? I think it's hilarious. Okay. It's hilarious. Yeah. Well, my personal favorite is the, the ladies bonking them on the noggin. <laughs> always so plays. A, la- a lady bonking you on the noggin for stealing peaches is always fun. Yeah. What's the, what's the entire effect of this whole passage? Harrogate's finally got to Knoxville. It's like really pathetic, but in a way that makes you Yeah, some people call out to the universe for punishment. I think a lot of the description in this section uses like gorgeous terms and makes us talk That's just like it was funny, but at the same time, like there's a lot of like like very slapstick, straight slapstick. Yeah, and the carnival. Right? So there's a Russian literary theorist named Mikhail Bakhtin. He's dead now. He's not named anything. But he was named Mikhail Bakhtin. And he ran afoul of Stalin when he lived under Stalin's uh, rule in the Soviet Union. And Stalin got mad at Bakhtin and sent him to Siberia. And Bakhtin was brilliant, but he was also a nicotine addict. He smoked like a chimney. And he had access to tobacco in Siberia in this gulag, but he did not have papers. And while he was in um, Siberia, he wrote his masterwork. He wrote this masterpiece of criticism and then realized he was out of rolling papers for his cigarettes. So he began to tear strips of his manuscript and roll his cigarettes up in, and he smoked his masterpiece. Now, so we don't have it. But the books that he didn't smoke, we do have. And in one called The Problems with Dostoevsky's Pedics, um, Bakhtin wrote about a principle he calls Carnival. And Carnival, of course, is the thing uh, celebrated in many Latin American countries and celebrated you have it in Brazil to this day. Um, it's a tradition of the Latin world. Um, and I think there are even some Eastern European countries that have a kind of version. Right, yeah. So the idea is that you have an oppressive government, a tyrant, right? And he doesn't give people freedoms. He, you know, basic human rights are stripped away from them. He will imprison them without trial and torture them and everything else. However, one day out of the year, there's this huge celebratory carnival where people don outrageous costumes and engage in public drunkenness and sometimes um, in public like sexual kind of escapades that normally would just not fly right and this one day out of the year you can pretty much do whatever right now Bakhtin talks about that in the context of literature a lot of critics see that, they read that, and they think that Bakhtin is talking about you know, something that's really wonderful. But Carnival, as it functions in the novel, and as it functions particularly in Sutri, is an oppressive force. And here's why. It's like a pressure cooker with a, with a release valve, a steam valve, right? So a pressure cooker runs really hot, and then at the point it would explode, there's a release valve, right? Releases steam. And that actually allows the cooker to run hotter. And in such a way, oppressive governments allow the populace what is basically a meaningless little release. They don't have the things they need, but on one day they get to go buck wild, and then the oppression comes back on. And a novel like Sutri, particularly in stretches of the book where you have the most despair-inducing, uh, gut-wrenching, you know, emotionally destructive kind of things happen, you have these slapstick moments. So, like, the concept is close to comic relief, 
But comic relief implies a kind of balance as opposed to like uh, a rhetorical technique, a storytelling technique that allows you to make the story darker, more oppressive, more impactful. You guys see what I'm saying? I think that is how that's functioning. Jackson. Tell me about that. More lifelike. I mean, like, terrible situations can happen, but there's still moments of, like, comedy in them. Most often times, depending on how you look at it. Um, but, like, I don't know. Not everything is so grim or dull. Like, sometimes mm -hmm. things are really like, mm -hmm. There is that balance in life. Even if you're going through incredible grief, you still are able to feel laughter or something along those lines. Why? Why? The masks of Greek drama face one another, comedy and tragedy. Yes, sir. It's so much. It's so much. Yeah, other, other thoughts about that? Let's take a look. Let's let's look at what this is, <sighs> the steam, the pressure that is being siphoned off. Page 148. As he was going up Gay Street, J. Bones stepped from a door and took his arm. Hey, bud, he said. How you doing? I was just started down to see you. Come in and have a cup of coffee. They sat at the counter at Helms. J Bone kept tapping his spoon. When the coffee was set before them, he turned to Sutri. Your old man called me, he said. He wanted you to call home. People in hell want ice water. Hell, bud, it might be something important. Sutri tested the cup rim against his lower lip and blew. Like what, he said. Well, something in the family, you know. I think you ought to call. He put the cup down. All right, he said. What was it? Why don't you call him? Why don't you tell me? Will you not call? No. Jay Bone was looking at the spoon in his hand. He blew on it and shook his head. The distort image of him upside down and the spoon's bowl misting away and returning. Well, he said, who's dead, Jim? He didn't look up. Your little boy. Sutri set his cup down and looked out the window. There was a small pool of spilled cream on the marble countertop at his elbow, and flies were crouched about it, lapping like cats. He got up and went out. Pretty devastating, this moment. I also think it's interesting that Cormac has withheld the information that Sutri is a father, that he was a husband until this moment. Why, as a storyteller, why, why withhold this until, until just now? Yeah. Like if you reveal that right off the bat that he's a deadbeat, you're not going to sympathize with him at all. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and. Cormac wants us to get this fuller picture of this guy. And then he gives us a piece of information. It's the first moment, I, I like Sutri. It's the first moment for me where I'm like, I don't like that, right? So not only has he rejected the family he was born into, he's rejected the family that he chose, produced, right? You're not supposed to do that. So Sutri goes down there. And then you have that, I, I can't even read it out loud, right? I do that scene where it's just all hell breaks loose. And people fighting and biting and kicking. It's just, just grief and misery, right? And then there's the funeral. Sutri attends, but he doesn't attend like a human being. He attends like a ghost. And then the family leaves and the uh, caretakers are about to bury the child, uh, the child's casket. Um, 
and Sutri insists on doing this. Why do you think Sutri insists on, on burying his boy? He has to do something that causes him pain. It's it's penance. Yes, ma'am. Hundred percent, absolutely. Well said, Zach. And also, even the existing in his household without having to think about or be reminded of this obligation. I mean, now that his son is dead, the very stark indication of it's like, hey, there's something really wrong and unnatural about the way you've chosen to live apart from your family. There, there is uh, almost condemnation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A condemnation upon you. Here's your dead kid. Here's your dead kid. Steve. I mean, this is something from like a, like a TV show that I watched, and like I feel like it relates. There's a woman who didn't want kids. She's like, she was like, but then she was diagnosed with something that mm-hmm. prevented her from trying to conceive. Mm-hmm. And I think that that really messed with her because it was like she, they, they lost something. Mm-hmm. What made them, you know? And I think with such a, like, he thought about not. I've had, yes, I've had women friends who have um, been ambivalent about having children, and then that ability is potentially threatened by a health concern, and, and they, um, and I'm not judging, critiquing, or anything like that. I, I get it. Like, but, the, you know, a kind of panic sets in, right? You know, once something... Once a decision is made for you, as opposed to you being able to make the decision for yourself, it, it, it's a different it's a different kettle of fish. Shana, did you have something to add? I thought you had a hand up. I was, I mean, I was just thinking, um, like, he hasn't been taken care of his kids. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-h
A paunchy man in tan gabardines looked up at him. Your name's Sutri? Sutri said it was. The man climbed out of the car. He wore a tooled belt and holster, and his clothes were neatly pressed. He opened the rear door of the car. Get in, he said. Sutri climbed into the back of the car, and the door shut after him. There was a heavy screen mesh separating him from the front seat, as if the car were used for hauling mad dogs about. There were no door handles or window cranks. The driver looked at him in the mirror, and the man in the gabardines looked straight ahead. Sutri leaned back and passed his hand over his eyes. As they came into town, people watched him from the street. Pull over here, Pinky, the man said. They came to a stop at the curb. Go get yourself a coat. I'm all right. Go get yourself a coat. The driver looked back at Sutri and climbed out and shut the door. The sheriff leaned one arm across the back of the seat and regarded Sutri through the wire. Then he climbed out and opened the back door. Get up here, he said. Sutri climbed out and got into the front of the car. The sheriff walked around and climbed into the driver's seat. He studied Sutri for a minute, and then he said, Let me tell you something. All right, said Sutri. He reached down and tapped Sutri's knee with his forefinger. You, my good buddy, are a 14-karat gold-plated son of a bitch. That's what your problem is. And that being your problem, there's not a whole lot of people in sympathy with you or with your problem. Now, I'm going to do you a favor against my better judgment, and it's not going to make me no friends. I'm going to drive your stinking ass to the bus station and give you an opportunity to get out of here. I don't have any money. I never reckoned that you did. I intend to put up $5 cash money out of my own pocket to get you started. I ain't interested in where you go, but I aim to see that you go $5 worth in some direction, and you and me both are going to hope that you don't never come back. Now, do you want to know why? Why what? Why I'm putting up the five dollars. No. I thought maybe the economics of it might interest you. I hear tell you're supposed to be real smart. I don't care. The reason I'm investing five dollars in your absence is because the man whose daughter's life you ruin happens to be a friend of mine and a man I not only like but respect And I'd like to see him have some peace of mind. I know he ain't going to thank me for this. What he'd like is to see you hung. But I know him for a fair-minded man and a peace-loving man. And I know that he'll be happier in his mind if he just gets you out of sight. He might even come to forget there ever was a low life like you, although I doubt it. What do you get out of it? Not a thing, good buddy. You said I ought to be interested in the economics of it. I said it, but I don't believe it. It's not much economics anyway. About the only thing to be said for getting fucked out of $5 is that you don't catch the clap. I never expected you to understand. No one cares. It's not important. That's where you're wrong, my friend. Everything's important. A man lives his life. He has to make that important. Whether he's a small town county sheriff or the president or a busted out bum, you might even understand that someday. I don't say you will. You might. The sheriff turned in the seat and reached for the key and turned it. But the motor was already running and the starter made a sudden wild screeching sound. He muttered to himself and shifted the gears, and they went on down the street. The bus station was in the back of a cafe, and when they pulled up in front, there were two buses idling in the alley. The sheriff shifted and took out his billfold and lifted a $5 bill from it and handed it across. I suppose I have to take it, Sutri said. You suppose correctly. Sutri took the bill and looked at it. Now... 
the sheriff said. I want you to take whichever bus out of here best pleases you, and I want you to ride $5 in that direction, and I don't want you back. You got that? I've got it. Sutry was holding the money in his hand. The sheriff looked at him. You all right? Yeah. I'm all right. I'm puzzled that you'd have the face to come here. Well, you're puzzled. I will say one thing. You've opened my eyes. I got two daughters, old as 14, and I'd see them both in hell for I'd send them up to that university. I'm damned if I wouldn't. How many sons have you got? Not any. Look, Sutri, I'm sorry as far as that goes. These people didn't want me to put you in jail. These people did want me to put you in jail. I know. Well, you got your ticket right in there. Don't let me see you on the street. You stay in there till your bus runs. You hear? Sutri opened the door and climbed out. He looked down at the sheriff, and then he shut the door. You take care, the sheriff said. Do you think the sheriff gets Sutri right or gets Sutri wrong here? Do you think he's right in his estimation of Sutri? Are you just tugging your hat? I think you start to see more after the talk because I think his attitude totally changes from when he gets the shit in the bar until he starts to leave. Whether it's just We don't know why yet. We don't know why yet. So that he could have a justifiable reason. I don't know. I still think either way it's he left without explaining. That's very evident. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's not just the family that hates him. I mean, the whole the fucking town hates him. The whole town hates so him. So obviously that family is important to the town. So like, it doesn't change the fact that he's a deadbeat. But I think that the, the sheriff is maybe. Subconsciously thinking that, oh, maybe there's more to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did show up. Mm -hmm. That's not just something any dead beat would do. Mm -hmm. he, did, he showed up and he, he dug the grave himself. Yeah, I'm surprised you had the face to come here. Others of you, what do you think? Do you, do you think that's, yeah, Zach? I think the sheriff does get Sutri right, but I also don't think it's subconscious because he's going, I mean, he makes this very clear to Sutri. He's going out of his way to get him out of town. Or wants him gone. Yeah. I, although, I don't know. If he had locked Sutri up, uh, I don't know that Sutri would have caused much trouble. You know, he doesn't. he's not like a hero gay who's going to be causing fights, tapping uh, his coin with a spoon all night. I feel right. like he would have been very compliant. So I don't know if he would have been too much trouble. And the people would have felt the sheriff and like they didn't want him to go. Yeah. So I, I think it has to be a motivation of pity of some kind because the, the sheriff seems to be, I mean, it's against his better judgment. I also think that he thinks that Sutri represents something that is dangerous to his community. Not in the sense that Harrogate's dangerous. Not in the sense that, like, I'm going to accidentally electrocute people, right? Hunting for whatever. I know, I know, we all just shake our head. I think that, I think this sheriff would rather deal with Harrogate than a Sutri. And that whole thing, like, I'd rather see my daughters in hell than at that university in Knoxville. What's that about? Because he doesn't want them to fall prey to Sutri. Because what Sutri has around people like Harrogate is he's charming. He can he fits into the society. There's no way to point out a Sutri in a crowd. 
Right. Those donors go up there. There's a very real chance that they'll marry someone like Sutri and get their like lives utterly ruined. And why would that? Why would someone like a Sutri? Why would this kind of person be at a university? Yeah, and it, I mean, it touches on something that's still huge today. There is a sense, like, with, I'm not, I'm not getting into the politics of it, I don't care about it, but, like, there's a sense in any kind of culture war discussion that the university is the place where, I mean, that's what middle America thinks about universities generally. Like, oh, they're radicalizing professors are radicalizing students. Um, they're not entirely wrong. Not entirely wrong. They're partly wrong, but not entirely wrong. Like, um, they believe that the university represents, universities represent, or they fear universities represent um, some kind of um, like leftist Marxist agenda. They ought to fear that universities represent nothing at all. That's what they ought to fear. But they don't fear that. That reminds me, has any of you guys seen this like a Christian propaganda movie called Dogma? Yes. 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 No, I haven't seen it. I've heard of it, though. I've heard so, You know what? Here's the weird thing. I've had that professor. Now, not in, like they weren't, they weren't trying to make us, I mean, they were like, you better denounce God if you want this B. It's not like that, right? But I had a, uh, actually, um, Western Civ professor, Dr. Mitchell. Shout out to Dr. Mitchell. He's, he was about a billion years old then, and that was a long time ago. Um, and he, what, like he saved his Jesus lecture toward the end, and like he got to that, and he wanted to tell everyone like the historical Jesus and the blah, 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 right. I mean, this was a huge thing. This is like I'm going to get rid of their religious um, illusions. So, so I I know what that stereotype is. Like that a version of that is there. It's not like all right now. You know, okay, here's your okay. Remember. Chapters five through seven, um, we're going to have the quiz. Your essays will be due a week after, and you'll need to denounce God by February 17th. <laughs> and you can do that online, or we'll also you can also denounce God. I, I, I will take that um, in, in my mailbox before five. So, yeah, I, I mean, it's absurd, but it's also, it ain't based on nothing, right? Ish, ish. Um, I, I, I just think it's fascinating, right? I, I think there's, there's a fear of education. And I get it, because cultures have always been afraid of like what is going to happen when someone leaves his home, his tightly knit community, and goes to another place and acquires a completely different set of values. Right? That, I think that's whatever those values might be. Maybe better, maybe worse. They're going to be different is, is the kind of danger. Um, 
this thing that the sheriff says on page 157. Sutri says, no one cares, it's not important. The sheriff says, that's where you're wrong. Everything is important. What does he mean, everything's important? Yeah. That's great. That's great. That's great. Yeah. I was talking um, to a friend about all this yesterday, and I like Sutri. I think he's a wounded animal at this point in the book. My friend loves the book Sutri and hates the character. He's like, he's a POS. And I'm like, well. Oh. And he's like, he's just a rich boy. He's just a rich boy. And I'm like, well, he is a rich boy. And he, he, he's talked about, like, Sutri LARPing, like, doing this kind of LARP. And, like, in a sense, that is what Sutri's doing, right? But, like, I argued what I argued in here on Tuesday. Like, <sighs> going back home for Sutri won't solve anything for him. It won't, it won't get rid of this thing he has. Um, what he's doing you know, hanging out with the, the misfits. And I don't mean like the misfits that might be interesting to hang out. I mean like Harrogate and Callahan and like those, those guys, right? The guys that take him out and he gets into fights and there's coming up on a section that's just insane. But that's not gonna, that's not the answer, right? Going back and knocking on daddy's door and saying, you know what, I want to be a lawyer after all. Let's go to law school. Like, that's also not the answer. So Sutri's in a, in a weird place. He wants to reject this very thing, this privilege, this wealth. But, like, he is not these people he's with. And he seems to have real difficulty accepting that, accepting that he's not. So, like, like a lot of people, like tons of Americans in their 20s, He's trying to figure out who he is. And where he came from doesn't seem to be the answer. And where he is doesn't seem to be the answer. And is there, is there a third way? Is there some kind of third path? And what's that going to look like?